I'm so glad my singing lessons for Caitlin have finally sunk in. <laughs> hey, I'm so glad that you uh, braved the rain and uh, made it here today because I truly believe uh, that we're going to talk about today is, is a life-saving message uh, that can make such a huge difference. This song that Kaylin just sang uh, is obviously about somebody who's been hurt in a relationship. And we're in a series right now called Love Like You've Never Been Hurt. And uh, so we're doing a couple of things. One is we're encouraging everybody to grab a copy of this Jensen Franklin book called Love Like You've Never Been Hurt. And then I'm encouraging you to be here on Sundays because we're covering stuff on Sundays that's not necessarily in the book, but kind of following the pattern of the book. And then maybe even the most important part of all this is I would love to encourage you to get involved in a small group, to get involved in a rock group and, and just, you know, get connected and, and work it out and work out some stuff. There's some stuff that you can work out in a, in a circle that you can never work out just sitting in a row. And this is a beautiful thing what we get to do here together uh, on Sundays and times that we gather, but there's also something incredible about just getting together and getting, getting real with real people. So I want to encourage you to take advantage of all of that. Um, my prayer in this series is not that we would just uh, log in a, a bit more information about relationships, but that we would actually see the healing power of God work in our hearts and our lives so that we could move together and be whole people who can do great things for the glory of God. Anybody with me on that? Come on. So last week, I started talking about this idea that, that I think all of us would buy, uh, is that life is better together. Uh, we are better together. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's, it's a big lights come on kind of moment when we do actually recognize that, that we is better than me. And that, uh, that we learn that, that, that to, to enter into relationship, to not be so argumentative or not be so stuck on our own way, but that there are some things it's okay to defer on. There are some, are some things it's okay just to go, you know what, for the sake of together, I, I'm going to go to a, a better space in life because there's just some things that uh, in life that just are so much better when we're together. Church is better when we're together, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, you know, I think people can have a relationship with Jesus that doesn't include church, but it's not what God really intended. Church is God's idea. And when we come together, like you may not be able to uh, have the capacity to feed all those kids down, just down the road, but together we can do something, right? And, you know, work is better when people learn to work together. Family is better, obviously, when it's together. Who likes broken family? No, no one does. Um, and even, even, even having fun is better together, right? But I think all of us would recognize as valuable and as positive as uh, together is, sometimes together hurts, and, uh, and, and I think to recognize that every relationship that we enter into, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a church uh, relationship, whether it's a marriage, uh, whether it's family, you know, uh, parents with children, children with parents, whether it's a work kind of relationship. In other words, there's a lot of different kinds of relationships but the reality is that, that every relationship is two selfish, imperfect people coming together. Somewhere in the midst of all of this is a recognition that, uh, that, that, that we are all at some level looking out for ourselves. What is this relationship going to do for me? And, what, and we are all imperfect. So, I go into a relationship with anybody, uh, and whether, it, whether it's uh, my relationship with you as your pastor or my relationship with 
with my wife or my kids or my friends or people I work with, with, you know, with, uh, with all the different relationships that happen. And there's lots of layers that come into two people coming together or three people coming together or four people coming together. So you have the layer of history where you don't know how they were raised. You don't know what their experience has been. You don't know if they've had a great experience in church or a negative experience in church. You don't know if they're dad was a good dad or, or an absent dad or, or worse, an abusive dad. You don't know if they've been wronged and, you know, some kind of male authority has wronged them or some kind of female authority has wronged them. And the, the history, you don't know all the history. So all of that's coming together. And then we all bring our expectations, and there's layers of those, to every relationship that we enter. And, and you don't even know sometimes what your expectations are, and yet we want other people to kind of be able to pick up on what our expectations are. And then, then we bring in layers of, of different kinds of personality. You know, some people uh, like to hang around people. Some people like to be by themselves. Some people like tasks. Some people are, you know, are, are not task oriented at all. So you have this layer of history. You have this layer of expectation. You have these layers of personality. And then, then you, then imagine you put together uh, the male perspective and the female perspective. And how many of you know that that's just a formula for somebody to get hurt? <laughs> It's just a formula for, for somebody to, to experience some pain. And the truth is, even, even the people who have absolutely the best intentions for you or for the relationship are ultimately going to hurt you. Somebody, somewhere, is going to hurt you. And whether that hurt is real or whether that hurt is just your perception of what happened, the hurt still feels real. And there's not, there's not, a, there's not an, any single relationship that's in our life that doesn't contain the potential for getting hurt. Even the best and most healthy people coming together, are, are, there's going to be hurt. And our ability to process hurt in relationships could literally be a life and death situation for us. And I want to encourage you in something that I believe God gives us as an answer to how to process all of this and how to deal with it and to recognize that a huge element in staying healthy and whole, a huge element in trying, continuing to love like you've never been hurt, is to understand the power of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not just an add-on to occasional situations. I'm going to, I'm going to go so far as to say, you got to Bake forgiveness in to every relationship. When you start going to church, you're going to have to bake forgiveness in. When you get married, you're going to have to bake forgiveness in. When you have kids, you're going to have to bake forgiveness in. When you take a job, you're going to have to bake forgiveness in. It's not an extra. It's literally foundational. It's, it is absolutely so important. We, think about this. We would, none of us would be able to have any kind of relationship with God if it weren't for forgiveness, right? And, and I'm going to suggest to you that if you can learn to walk in a spirit of forgiveness, you're going to have healthy relationships. But if you can't learn to walk in forgiveness in life, you're going to eventually ruin every relationship that's in your life. It's that important. So I want to start out with, uh, there's a there's 100 places I could start in the New Testament 
to talk about this idea, but I want to start with Ephesians chapter 4 and read a couple verses and get going on some of the thoughts I have for today. Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. I think this would be a great scripture to put as like a heading on all of social media. It would reduce what I see in my feed by a half, I'm sure, or change it. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. I want to add a scripture to this. Hebrews 12, verse 15, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness, everybody say bitterness, springing up causes trouble, and by that root of bitterness, many will be defiled. Bitterness. Bitterness, resentment, it's the result of hanging on to an offense. It's the result of of hanging on to a hurt. Uh, the, the original language actually m- helps to see that this concept of bitterness literally means a bad taste in your mouth. And when if you've got a really bad taste in your mouth, it doesn't matter how good the food is that you eat, it all tastes bad because you've got a bad taste in your mouth. And when a person allows bitterness and resentment to collect in their soul, it literally is poison for your soul. It, it is, you, in other words, you could meet an exceptional person who you could have a great relationship with, but it won't taste good because you got a bad taste in your mouth. You could walk into a church that could be God's answer to your prayer, but if you've got bitterness towards church or pastors or leaders, then you're never going to be able to taste what's there. And, it, and, and I, could, I could go on and on and on for help, help us understand that when bitterness and resentment get in your soul, it, it, it's, it's poison to you. And bitterness actually comes with a family, Bitterness doesn't come by itself. And so uh, Ephesians 4.31, which we just read, I'm going to ask him to put it back up again. Uh, So let all bitterness and wrath, wrath is the idea of explosive outward anger. It's wrath is road rage. (laughs) Uh, You know, wrath is somebody who who blows up, who, who just, who, you know, has that kind of anger. The word anger here, it literally contains the idea of implosive anger. In other words, it's not somebody who's outwardly yelling or outwardly angry, but they're kind of seething, kind of inward sort of resentment and anger inside of them. And, and a lot of the people who study personality and the way people operate would say that a lot of depression is really anger turned inward. Your your expectations haven't been met. You're angry. It's on the inside, and you're kind of depressed. And and that kind of anger can show up in, in somebody's life, and it's just, it's kind of on the inside, and they're always a little bit resentful, and they're carrying this inward kind of anger. And then uh, also in the family of bitterness is the idea of, of clamor, which literally means an argumentative spirit. And have you ever met someone that they're always got to find the other angle that, that is argumentative? No matter what you say, no matter what you do, it, they are the ones who are always finding a way to argue. I've met people, gifted people, great people, people that even love God, but they're so argumentative, they've got such a clamorous spirit that they can, they can never fit in. <laughs> they, can, they can never get together. And then, then the idea that comes with uh, the fl- family of bitterness is slander. Slander is, is when, when we are talking about people, mainly behind their back, in an effort to try to destroy their reputation or destroy their character. So 
when you get resentful towards somebody or you get hurt by somebody, what often happens is you start to build a case about what's wrong with them. And could I just say that if you want to build a case about what's wrong with anybody, you could do it. If you want to build a case about what's wrong with me, you could do it. Don't. But if you want to build, you could build a case about, I've, I've read articles that were negative case building against Mother Teresa. So, so the truth is, here's what happens. Here's what bitterness does. Here's what resentment does. You got hurt, and now you are navigating in on all the faults of that person or that church or that job or that president or that whatever is, you know, is there, and, and slander starts, and it starts, you're building your case for why it's justified that you are upset with them. You've never done this, but you can tell somebody about it. And, sl- and slander won't just stay on that one person. Soon you're building a case against everybody. Everybody who possibly offends you. Everybody who's opposed to you. Everybody who told you maybe no or wait. And you're, 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 you're building this case and it, it starts to affect us. It starts to get in our spirit. And now we're building a case against everything and everybody. And it makes it almost impossible. It's, it's poison to your soul. And then, and then the verse says, if you could put it back one more time, along with malice. Malice is, I want them to be hurt. I want them to pay. And when it gets in the Christian world, the church world, we kind of, we want to spiritualize it like, oh yeah, God is getting them now. Like somehow we think their demise is going to help you. But their demise has nothing to do with you. But yet there's something inside of us when we let bitterness and uh, resentment get going inside of us. And we have to realize, I don't need anybody else's demise for me to succeed. (laughs) I I don't need anybody else to go down. And the cure for bitterness... The cure for resentment is forgiveness. Forgiveness sets you free. Forgiveness is releasing. It's letting it go. It's moving on. And I think, I think what happens in all of us, I think we all have this thing where where we just, you know, somebody does something wrong to us and we're like, they owe me an apology. And we hear a song like, it's too late to apologize. I told you I was teaching Caitlin how to sing. And and we're thinking somebody, if they, as soon as they give me an apology. But can I tell you, by and large, you're not going to get an apology. If, if they would only pay me back for what they did wrong to me. And forgiveness is saying, I let go my expectation of apology. I let go of you owe me because I'm going to move on with my life. Forgive me. You're releasing them, but what you're really releasing is you. Many of us can remember the story a few years ago, a couple years ago, beautiful young lady, Elizabeth Smart, 14 years old, 
some crazy guy sneaks into the house, any parent's nightmare, and kidnaps this 14-year-old girl and takes her away. For nine months, she's missing. For nine months, this guy has got her with his other wife in captivity, trying, treating her like a wife. She's just a 14-year-old girl. But by the grace of God, she is found and rescued from this situation. And her mother gives, us, gives her this incredible advice. She said, honey, they stole nine months from your life. I want to encourage you to not let them steal another day. And she said, I want you to forgive them, and I want you to choose the best payback you could ever give is be happy and move on with your life. And I know there's something that's easily inside of us that goes, yeah, wait a minute, that was so wrong, wait a minute. And I'm thinking, what, what, an, not an, what just an incredible move by Elizabeth Smart, 14-year-old girl, what an incredible move by her mom to say, I'm going to let it go. But they knew this truth that I'm talking about today, that you could just say, those nine months, he owes me, he did me wrong, I've got this resentment, I've got this bitterness, I've got this anger, I've got this issue going on inside of me, but by letting it go, releasing it, forgiving, move on, we can become everything God's called us to be. When when, when we don't forgive other people, when we don't release other people, we're literally holding on to them, still demanding payment in our soul. We're actually the ones who are being hurt still because we're enslaved to the memory of what they did. And the truth is, they may not even know we have these feelings going on inside of us. But we're still churning over it and replaying it. And we replay the video over and over. And, the, and, the, and they, they get worse and worse as the video plays over and over in life. Savoring every piece of pain. Somehow saying, I don't want that pain in my life, but holding on to that pain. Buddy Hackett who is probably not the guy I'd go to for wisdom on everything, but uh, he was a comedian uh, way, several decades ago. Uh, and, but he did make a statement that I thought is a lot of wisdom. He said, I've had a few arguments with people, but I never carry a grudge. You know why? While you're out carrying a grudge, they're out dancing. They're not even thinking about you. They're all you can think about. And so what I'm encouraging us to step into today, and not just like be strong, but embrace the help of the Holy Spirit to help you let go and, and get healed up. They hurt you in the past, and they may have ruined things for you in the past, but you don't have to keep giving them power to ruin you today. And when we don't forgive and we don't release and we're really carrying their hurt and their, their ability to continue to hurt us into every new circumstance, into every new relationship. You know, sometimes I think when we don't get it and understand why, why would God say to us, forgive them. Doesn't he know what they did? Can I tell you that God knows way better than we know? And I think unforgiveness is one of the clearest expressions of the insanity of sin. Because we hold on to it feeling justified. They did me wrong and they owe me. In truth, God's saying, forgive. Let it go. It's actually disobedience. And he's not giving us just another thing to obey. He knows what's right for your soul. 
Uh, I've spent my adult life in church life. And here's what I know. I've been hurt in church. And I know there's a lot of people, they bailed on church because they got hurt in church. My greatest joys in friendship have happened in church. My greatest pain in friendship has happened in church. So if somebody wants to say, well, I don't, I don't like church anymore because they hurt me. I'm going to say, hey, I could one-up you on every single hurt there is. But here's what I know. Coming into church is going to be another great friend. Coming into church is going to be another great person. Coming into my life is going to be another great friend. And every time I go, forget it, I got hurt there, I'm never going to be involved in church again, I cut myself off from the future that God has for me. So verse 32, Ephesians 4 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgive each other, just as God and Christ also has forgiven you. So the Bible is telling us we should forgive as God forgave. Now, let me drill down on that for a minute. Because when God forgave us, and as God forgives us, God never says, you know, what you did wasn't so bad. Don't worry about it. No, the truth is, what we did was so bad, he had to put his son on a cross to pay the price because it was so bad. So God never got this, oh, never mind, don't worry, it wasn't so bad. Forgiveness is not you saying they didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes I think when we, when we forgive, it sort of feels like they won. I'm giving in to them. I, I'm, I'm, I'm letting evil win. But I want to shift perspective for us today and help us realize you're never more in control than when you forgive. For, forgiveness is not an act of weakness. Forgiveness is an act of awesome strength. Forgiveness is not just blindly saying, oh, no worry, nothing ever happened. When we forgive, we are releasing ourselves, but we're also releasing that person into God's hands. And what it does is it removes us from the posture of the judge. Because when you're the judge, you know you, you feel like you've got to exact the sentence. And forgiveness is allowing God to be the judge. And if he chooses to forgive them, the same way he chose to forgive you, I think we often want to see God get them. <laughs> get them, Lord. I'm your child and they did something wrong to me. Get them, Lord. But let me just ask you this question. How much have you been forgiven of? You want the blessing of God in your life. And you're not, you're getting it because he forgave you. It's never going to take anything away from you for them to be blessed. It's easy to think this way when I'm talking to you in church. <laughs> Corralling the emotions is a different story. First Peter chapter 2 says, you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you. He left us an example 
for us to follow in his steps. He committed no sin. He, had, he never did anybody wrong at all, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Keep going. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. And this is where I want us to focus. But he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Wow. Jesus kept entrusting himself to the management of the Father's care. When you forgive, it's not just saying, oh, that never happened, or that wasn't wrong. What it is, is you're going, I'm taking my life out of your hands, out of the pain you caused me, out of the wrong you did, and I'm going to put my life into the hand. I'm going to keep entrusting my life into God's hands. I know it's a big move, but I want to encourage you. If you're going to love like you've never been hurt, if you're going to be whole, if you're going to make it, you, you got to keep taking your life out of the hands of pain causers and keep putting your life into the hands of a God who loves you. When, when we forgive, we are literally saying, what you do wrong to me cannot ultimately be greater than God's ability to work in my life. Come on. And I think sometimes we don't realize we're holding on, resentful, and often we're blocking God's work in them. Thank God Stephen, the martyr, Paul is holding the coats of people who are stoning him. And, and Stephen says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 21st century language, Father, forgive them. They are ignorant. They don't really know what's going on. And by, I think by doing that, he released Saul, who eventually, God did such a work in him that he had a, such a transformation that his name was changed to Paul, and he became one of the greatest thinkers, one of the greatest writers, one of the greatest evangelists that the church has ever known. So let me give you a couple of uh, practical kind of thoughts that could close us out on this. Six keys. If you're a note taker, uh, this would be a good time to get started. If you're not a note taker, this would be a good time to get started. Just, just quickly, six thoughts. Number one is decide on forgiveness as a way of life. When I say you got to bake it in, you got to bake it in. You got you got to. The longer you hold on to resentment, the harder it is to let go. The longer you hold on to bitterness, you, you got to have the Barney Fife philosophy. You got to nip it, nip it in the bud, and just. Learn to be a forgiver. The quicker, the easier. Harbored hurts that you stew on turn into resentment, and resentment turns into bitterness. I love what Brian Houston said. He said, no mature Christian who's seasoned in the word has any reasonable excuse to live their life offended. The second key, I think, to walking in forgiveness would be this. Forgiveness is a choice first. Because I don't care how holy you are, your emotions want revenge. And you're going to have to make a choice against and over top of your emotions. And you might for a while have to make that choice over and over and over again. Now, I believe the Holy Spirit will help us if we'll just start making the choice to forgive. Because I don't think this is just a mental activity. I, I really believe there's something spiritual, powerful, supernatural that the person of the Holy Spirit will meet you at your choice and heal your heart. 
But I also want to say it this way. If you're going to wait around till you feel like forgiven, it's not going to happen. You make a choice, and then you make another choice, and you meet the Holy Spirit. Third thing is to always recognize this, that forgiveness releases you from the offender. As long as you hold on to their hurt, you are carrying them with you. You are binding yourself to them. Forgiveness is release. Forgiveness is setting you free. Forgiveness is letting go for your own sake. Release it to God. Unload this thing to to God and say, God, keep trusting myself into the management of your care. Number four, and I think this one is so important to understand, forgiveness is not becoming a doormat. Forgiveness is not just keeping yourself in a position where you're a doormat for abuse. You know, Jesus taught us that we should turn the other cheek. And I know some people certainly look at it, and it's not wrong to look at it as somebody slaps you in one cheek, turn the other cheek. But you do have another cheek. And sometimes you got to take that other cheek and you got to turn that other cheek. Come on. And you. <laughs> Thank you. I never thought I'd get applause for sticking my butt out at our church, but, but sometimes you, you let it go, but you got to learn to walk away. Because forgiveness still recognizes that wrong is wrong. Forgiveness doesn't call wrong right. But come on, let's remember Jesus walked in complete forgiveness, but he also said, I don't entrust myself to everyone. I, I, don't, I don't trust everybody. I forgive everybody, but I can't say that I trust everybody. Jesus didn't allow himself to become anybody's doormat. He made the choices along the way. So I just, I just want to help us understand something. For, forgiveness is one thing. Trust is another thing. Number five, uh, key to walk in forgiveness is Realizing that forgiveness of others is really an extension of God's forgiveness to you. So I extend the forgiveness I've received. I'm forgiven because he forgave me. And I'm able to forgive others because if Jesus paid the price for what I did wrong, he also paid the price for what they did wrong. And then the last thing I want to give us is this idea Forgiveness puts you in charge spiritually. Father, forgive them, Jesus said. They don't know what they're doing. Stephen said the same thing. I think what both Jesus and Stephen were displaying, that as long as you hold resentment, as long as you hold bitterness, you're attaching yourself to their ignorance. And Jesus and Stephen both said, you know what? They don't get it. Maybe they got layers of history. Maybe they got layers of misperception. Maybe they got layers of hurt themselves. But I'm going to let them go and move on. Here's a beautiful statement. Proverbs 19, 11. It's the glory of a man to overlook an insult. In other words, you got to be bigger. There's nothing of weakness in forgiveness. It's actually the strength of one person saying, no more are you going to hurt me. No more am I going to carry your pain. I want to pray with you today. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, please, for a few moments. Father, we're all in this room and we've been hurt. We've hurt others. Maybe our dad, maybe a pastor, maybe a coworker, maybe a friend, maybe a spouse, maybe a child. And we're coming to you today 
as our hearts wrestle with what we know is true and our emotions struggle to let go. Father, I'm praying that you will help every one of us enter into the healing and the wholeness that comes as a result of forgiving, of letting go, of unloading our lives into the hands of God and watching what you'll do in our world. While your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, these last few moments together, I, I want to pray. Maybe you've never actually just surrendered your life to Jesus. I would love to pray with you. Let's start that journey. Maybe you're here today and you know you used to be closer to Jesus than you are today. And you know in your heart of hearts, it's time to come back home. And I would love to pray with you. Maybe you feel like unsure. You don't feel confident about where you stand with God. If you're in any one of those places, you've never surrendered to Jesus before, or you know you've got to come back to Him, or you just don't feel confident but you want to, and you say, Pastor, that is me. Would you pray with me? I want you to lift your hand real high all over this room. And just say, yes, God bless you. Come on, anybody else? Just lift your hand and say, I, I, I want to surrender to God. God bless you. I want to come back. I want to know for sure that I am where I need to be. God bless you. Because this isn't, this isn't a call to get it together. This is a call to walk into forgiveness. <laughs> to walk into love, to walk into the Father's care. Is there anybody else that said, would you pray with me? Amen. Thank you. I want us to all pray this together. This is for everyone who lifted their hand, but could we all say these words together? Everybody say, Lord Jesus, I open my life, I open my heart to your love and to your Lordship. I need you. I want you in my world as my Lord. I, I know I've sinned, but I'm coming to the cross where you paid the price for my forgiveness. Today is a fresh start. It's a new beginning. Help me become the person you created me to be. Amen. Come on, let's thank the Lord.